Welcome back to Watches Live. It's the only show we film here on Watchbox Reviews. Guys, we have an incredible array of mostly sports watches on the table tonight, but I did pack a few special dress limited editions and complications for those of you of a more genteel sensibility. As ever, the watchbox.com, the best place to buy, trade, and sell luxury watches. Friends, joining me from around, I can see Eddie Landsberg is first, Russell 996, Simon Holt from Hollywood, Northern Ireland, Philip Hayden, and John Velez. Welcome, guys. Well, I like to please, so I'm going to go straight for the big gun. You saw the blue sub on our teaser, our thumbnail, and if you are watching this recorded, or masthead. This is a fantastic timepiece from 2008 that represented not just the first serial production white gold Rolex Submariner, but also the first use of a blue cerachrome bezel. It was a landmark watch back then, and for the first couple of years, it shared this gorgeous blue lacquer dial with the two-tone sub. From 2009 to 2012, that was the rule, but as of 2013, the two-tone sub went back to the much-loved sunburst metallic blue, leaving only the full white gold and full yellow gold subs with this gorgeous blue lacquer that perfectly matches the serochrome. What you can't see is what I can feel, the incredible mass of this watch on the wrist. It is a relatively stealthy gold Rolex. If you're gonna wear Rolex, a conspicuous brand, and you're gonna wear gold, a conspicuous material, this is the way to do it like a connoisseur. Low profile, high quality, and it's gray gold. So it's the same Rolex manufacturer alloy created in their own foundry smelted in their own facilities, and thus solid 18 karat white gold, you never have to rhodium plate a modern white gold Rolex. That's what gray gold is. It's 18 karat white gold straight through. And if you guys are fans of the Versus series, you should know that is going to be the defending champion for this Sunday's Versus comparison. The Challenger, I'm glad you asked, because the Challenger is here with me tonight, and it is a doozy, a possibly unique Ulysse Nardin, Maxi Marine Diver. The Maxi Marine Diver came out in 2003. It was the larger dive-oriented equivalent to the Maxi Marine, or the Marine Diver and the standard Ulysse Nordin Marine chronometer, wrist chronometer. So what makes this one special is it's part of a 2006 special series of 500 pieces. And you can see the individual number plate on the flank, literally number, I believe that is 410 of the 500 made. But what makes this one unique is the fact that it was delivered on a matching white gold bracelet. The standard limited edition featured a rubber strap with titanium intermediate links, so it was mostly a strap-clad special edition, with the exception of this single example. With the result that this model right here, which now retails pre-owned for eighteen to 19000 was a $50,600 watch in the late 2000s. A very special piece. It's made more so by the presence of a flink Okay, lacquer, bezel, and dial. You can see the checker print of the dial underneath a translucent blue lacquer, and there is a wave pattern that has been embossed onto the base of the bezel underneath a second layer of translucent lacquer. Now, it features the marine chronometer dial layout, all applied white gold indices, white gold hands, power reserve scale like a marine chronometer or a deck clock at 12 o'clock, and a combination small seconds with a inverted cyclops eye. The cyclops eye magnifier for the date is actually underneath the crystal, giving it this one a clean look. And for those of you who perhaps have strong views about the Cyclops eye on Rolex watches, you can see how it changes the profile of the crystal on the Rolex compared to the UN. The UN a lot cleaner, the Rolex admittedly iconic, but it's not to everyone's taste. You'll also note from that angle just how much thinner the Rolex is, but you get your money's worth with this white gold UN Maxi Marine Diver, because this one pre-owned is about 18 to 19, and the sub pre-owned is about 22 to 25. This is a very special piece, and I appreciate that UN created a dive watch without blatantly plagiarizing the norms of dive watch design laid out by Blancpain and Rolex in the early 1950s. Blancpain, with a very orthodox dive design to this day, albeit a bit bigger than Rolex's, those two are doppelgangers for each other. UN went entirely in its own direction while still delivering a very functional diver. Okay, jump into the chat box. Mike K. Tim, we missed you yesterday. Thank you. I missed you guys too. I wasn't absent by choice. It was just one of those things. I'll be back next Monday. So specs from Dustin. Okay, 
surprisingly, the Rolex 40 millimeters and the UN 42.7, you'd swear it's a 45 just by looking at it, but the UN is actually a 42.7. So these are a lot closer in raw measurements than you might suspect. Uh, together, they weigh well over a pound and a half. Incredible mass and class, both. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which one I choose, but I will say this. One of the more fascinating distinctions between them is not just the lacquer dial of the UN, but the fact that you do get a full display case back of a 22 karat gold winding mask by UN and a chronometer grade ETA 2892A2 in the UN. By the way, UN making its own power reserve small seconds module for that watch. Okay, jump into an entirely different kind of high horology diver. Let's talk about two from smaller brands. UN, obviously a small brand, now a sister brand inside carrying with Gerard Pergo. Gerard Lecoult, the number one movement manufacturer, both in terms of credentials and volumes within the Richemont group. So JLC launched the Master Compressor Diving Series in 2007. By 2009, it had already been morphed into the somewhat apocryphal relationship with the U.S. Navy SEALs, the Master Compressor Diving Navy SEALs. I prefer the 2007 and 2008 model that's just a diver, not pretending to be commando equipment. You compare that to the counterpart from the same period. This is the Gerard Perigo Seahawk Pro, an extreme diver with helium escape valve and a unique off-centered crown guard and shear guard structure. What makes the UN interesting is that you get a power reserve scale so you can tell how close your watch is to running out of power before dive. What makes the JLC interesting is that the JLC gives you a 24-hour second time zone. They are very close in size with the UN being 44.8 millimeters in diameter and the JLC being 40 what really sets them apart, in my opinion, is that the JLC movement, the 975D Auto Tractor, is internally much tougher than the GP GPO33. Moreover, JLC gives you what might be the best diving bracelet and clasp of the 2000s. First, entirely titanium underneath vulcanized rubber. The oldest of these are now over a decade old. We know they stand the test of time. Every individual link is removable, and it's important to note that the screws are external, whereas on the pure titanium non-wrapped version of that bracelet, the screws are actually inside the links, so you have all screw fixtures, but they are a bear to get to. You want the vulcanized bracelet because it's an easier one to adjust yourself. Now the clasp, twin trigger times two. Four triggers, double deployant, absolute security when closed. This is an over-engineered bracelet that features the equivalent of a half-removable link, Rolex Easy Link style, in each side of the clasp. So you have two micro-adjustments and a bracelet that is entirely sizable. The bezel itself features the best detent action, this side of a Doxa or a Panerai, and I'm going to give you a listen to that. It is very crisp. It's it's chunky, it's loud, it's got just enough resistance that it's gratifying when it gives, but not so much that you're going to have difficulty manipulating it with wet, sweaty, or gloved hands. And let, let me let you hear the UN bezel by comparison. You hear how much quieter that is? It's good, but the JLC is great. Remember, the JLC is up there with what I consider to be the best in class, Doxa and Panerai subs. It's like a belt-fed machine gun compared to the others on the table tonight. Now, the Gerard Pergo is an interesting watch. It has a 120-click bezel, so very precise, not quite as chunky as the JLC. It doesn't have quite the same gratifying detent, but it has a very precise action. A couple things to note about this bezel. It features a rubber inlay that offers a high level of scratch and scuff resistance. The bezel itself is loomed, and this is something I consider mandatory on a diver. I've seen a lot of quote-unquote dive watches that feature robustly loomed dials, but actually lack a luminescent pearl on the bezel. No such problem here. What I find quirky about this dial is the fact that the power reserve scale has its own separate loomed hand. Now, there's plenty of functionality here. Plenty of Luminova on both the hands and the dial itself. It's the granular surface and the few splashes of judiciously chosen red color that really bring this one to life for me. It has a wonderful clasp that is on par with the JLC in terms of solidity. And you'll note that not only does it feature a double deployant action, but it matches the JLC's micro adjustment with a single 
10 millimeter adjustment system. You can see how you can move it 10 millimeters or one centimeter. If you want to cut this one to size, you can do so, but you're not a slave to the length as you do have that push button slider built into the clasp. Double deployant, made of steel, trigger actuation so it can't pop open. It features a matching slider on the opposite side. So with five millimeters on one side and 10 on the other, you wind up with the equivalent of 15 millimeters of incremental adjustment, just enough to cinch, cinch it over a dry or a wetsuit. It is a huge watch, but I should throw this one on the wrist so you can see how this unconventional dive profile wears on a smaller wrist. It succeeds on two levels. First, it's a very different take on the extreme diver. Over 1,000 meters with helium escape valve means this is more comparable to something like an Omega Planet Ocean or a Rolex Sea Dweller. But being GP and hailing from a manufacturer that builds between 20 and 25,000 watches a year, it's a much lower volume product. It wears bigger than 44. That said, while it looks like a 46 or a 47 on the wrist, you can see the camber of the case is actually arcing around my wrist. It's fitting my wrist by a little bit of tumble home to each side. You'll also note that there's a curved profile to the spring bars, so the strap can pull straight down. It doesn't want to fight and flare my wrist. The size is bombastic. It's oversized. It's visible in the utility sense. It's probably too much for the office, but then again, most luxury watches are, whether discreet or not. We spend a lot of money to smile, and this watch makes me smile. I love this Seahawk Pro. One of the real underrated divers of the 2000s. Okay, I can see right here we've got friends coming in from far and wide. David saying, Rolex greater than Omega. Peter K, I'm still floored, Tim, that you sold off most of your collection. What is the state of your collection remaining? My main pieces are Grandpa's Omega, his retirement watch. My graduation watch, a Bond-style Seamaster from the early 2000s. My Zin EZM 1.1, present and correct. And I've got a Accutron from 1974 with the caliber 214 tuning fork movement. There's this EZM 1.1 that I've told you guys about lately. That's pretty much my everyday wear these days. And I've got two swatches that my lovely mother bought me for Christmas 2013 and for my birthday in 2017. The System Frog is the birthday watch. You guys know that one. And I can see right here, uh, Howdy from Texas is asking if that was PVD on the JLC bracelet. No, it's not. It's a rubber wrapped bracelet, so it is titanium cord. Every individual link is titanium. And if you buy this with a gold JLC diver, you'll find that it's rubber wrapped gold and priced accordingly. But this is not PVD. This is rubber wrapped, far more durable. This is actually more scratch and scuff resistant than the pure titanium version and more durable. I like the fact that refinishing of bracelet is basically off your radar when you're wearing this. It's not gonna happen, so you don't have to worry about it. And it is very comfortable, as underneath there are big gaps to vent the wrist on a hot day. This is one of the best bracelets you'll ever encounter. Uh, David Bredden of A Blog to Watch actually bought a 42 millimeter Navy SEAL diver from us. He said, Tim, call me when you get the vulcanized rubber wrapped bracelet. And I said, okay, I will. When I finally got it, I called him and I made a video calling him out. And you know what? The man stepped up, he bought the watch. David, I hope you're enjoying it. Okay, I can see right here. We uh, say, uh, Brick Lane is calling me a bit of a longa man. Now, I've always been a longa man. I love our friends from Saxony and I love what they do with fine watches. Zeitwerk for me, please. Oh, right. Right here, Brick Lane also saying, AP Royal Oak 15300 blue dial is getting impossible to find. I do believe we have one for sale. It may be gone, but we had one recently. And I could see the class unboxing is saying this isn't live. Am I being gaslit on my own show? <laughs> okay, let's jump into the dress watch arena for those of you so inclined. Two from the anniversary year. I call it the 76th anniversary, but IWC officially told us that 2015 was the 75th anniversary of the Portuguese, or in the lingua franca, ironically of Schaffhausen, German, we call it the Portugueser. So this is a watch, 43 millimeters in two separate editions designed to evoke the original 1939, not 1940 reference 325 Portugueser. So these are both 43. This one, the 510205, is stainless steel, one of 750 pieces made. This one, the 510206, is one of 175 made in red gold. But the action side of both of these watches is the back side, where you have it, well, let me 
find one without a sticker, where you have a manufacturer caliber 59215. Now it's manual wind. It's based on the 50,000 series seven day automatic, but what sets this one apart is that by stripping away the automatic mechanism, they're able to modify to add case back power reserve and give you an extra day of power reserve. So that single huge mainspring barrel gives you 192 hours of reserved marsh. There is a power reserve scale discreetly placed on the case back so as not to mar the lines of the dial. The date at six o'clock is contentious on this watch. Not everyone loves it. I happen to like it because I think it's well hidden and with a monotone disc on either version, it is quite discreet. If it really bothers you, set it to six o'clock or set it to the sixth of the month every day, I should say. But everything else about this dial just zings me. Let's talk about the hands, foil or leaf fashion, beautifully elongated to kiss the minute scale with a sector style minute scale and Art Deco tri Arabics 9, 12, and 3. Now there is a miniature and countersunk crosshair style sub seconds dial at six o'clock. It does have a little bit of depth to it and if you look at the crystal, it's a box section sapphire designed to evoke the plexiglass on the original vintage Portuguese. -er. The very first commissioned by Rodriguez and Teixeira, the importers of IWC to Portugal, was a watch for the wrist designed to encase an ultra accurate pocket watch caliber. So to have a more accurate pocket watch caliber in the 1930s, they needed a pocket watch sized wrist watch. Today, we still have a pocket watch sized caliber and it's still quite accurate. Breguet over coil hairspring on the free sprung balance and you'll note adjusted to five positions like a chronometer. These are very accurate, very finely tuned machines, deceptively complex, you'd never guess from that watch face. All right, see what's going on right here. I could see right here, Mike K saying, Tim loved JLC, I don't understand. I do love JLC and I still love JLC and I still have one more in my collection. That's what I forgot to tell you. I kept my E877 Snowdrop Memovox. My vintage Memovox, the hardest watch to find in my JLC collection remains the representative of La Grande Maison. And I will never sell that one. That is that is my, mem my memento of my time as a JLC collector. Otherwise, sometimes you have to go back to formula and simplify. All right, uh, Mark S. asking, Tim, what part of Atlanta did you live in? I lived in an area that was called Woodstock. And, you know, it was early in my life. I was a kid back then. I was four, five, six, but I, I remember it was called Woodstock. And I can see right here we have a request from JBO Surf of Adelaide for a wrist shot of the 750-piece IWC Anniversary Portugueser in steel on my wrist. It is a lovely piece. It really does wear compact. It's a thin watch, only 12.5 millimeters thick. This is one to wear with a dress cuff. Though oversized, the Portuguese has always been oversized. I hear people whining about how it should be 38 millimeters. I'm sorry, what are you talking about? Go buy a Calatrava if you want an Art Deco-inspired form-fitting function case in that size range. The Portuguese has always been large. It's always been the fashion. Sizing it down is itself a perversion. Give me 43, give me this watch. All right, jump into another dress watch from a very different sensibility. I need to wind this one up. I don't remember whether I've given this watch a full shake on the show and it does deserve its spotlight solo, but this is the 2018 Grubel 4C GMT Earth. I think I teased it on Brian's show on a Wednesday, several weeks prior, but this is a watch that deserves the best camera work and light we've got. Three-dimensional sapphire, you can see it's not just cambered, it's box section. And for 2018, you can see the 360 degree globe through the flank of the case. It is a full titanium globe that is assembled, lacquered, and then features a hand-finished dressage or brushed grain on the continents. Now, it features a real-time, world-time gauge, so you can actually line up your reference city wherever you are with the 24 principal time zones of the world. There is a 25-degree inclined 24-second tourbillon, so that's not the conventional 60 second tourbillon, nor is it Grubel 4C's four minute tourbillon. It makes a full circuit every 25 seconds. It features an overcoil hairspring, a free sprung balance architecture. It is flying along, as you can see, almost too fast to get a purchase on it. The 
cage itself is continuously rounded and black polished. The bridge is black polished. There's a smoked sapphire for your local time zone. The watch is loomed. How crazy is that? There's a second time zone. And as you can see, there is a GMT pusher adjuster that allows you to quickly adjust it on the fly. If you hold the GMT adjuster and you turn the crown, you can adjust the two time zones independently while setting the globe. There is a second world time display on the case back. And take note, there are white gold scales at center for summertime and outboard for standard time. And you'll see that the cities that feature white or I should say white translucent flares are actually those that use daylight savings time. So these sort of spiral fashion flares that neck down to a small inner scale can be aligned with daylight savings hours or if you read outboard standard time. The watch accommodates both. Now this is a limited series of 33 pieces in white gold. If you ask how big is it, it is 45.5 millimeters. If you ask how thick it it is 16.3 millimeters thick, and I will show it to you on my wrist. Because Grubel 4 c designs its watches to be worn. Since I would ask, and I wouldn't blame if you did, 610,000 Swiss francs, or just a little bit over 610,000 US dollars. The watch is white gold, and here's what you're paying for. You're paying for finish, you're paying for invention, and you're paying for a brand that employs 100 people in Le Chaux de Fonds to make 100 watches a year. Other than maybe Philippe Dufour or a one-man band of his ilk, hardly any brand has a higher ratio of employees to production. Absolutely gorgeous. Another feature that needs to be called out is how deep the movement is. The movement is 36.4 millimeters in diameter, but the movement, just the movement, is 11.55 millimeters thick. And if you look at the bridges, they are German silver. If you look at every surface, it's been finished. And not with the typical cliches. There are only a handful of blued screws. You're looking at them right there. There are no Cote de Genève. There's no engine turned perlage. Even the finishing style is original on a Grubel 4 -C. And you'll note that they use cambered sapphires on the case back too. Ruinously expensive, but this is cost no object watchmaking. Look at the details. Look at the concave mirror polished lug flanks. Look at the micro text, basically saying that they're preserving the fine finishing, the art of manufacture, traditional timekeeping in Switzerland. I just saved you a lot of eye strain and translation right there. Manual wind, three-day power reserve in spite of that hyperactive tourbillon, stacked mainspring barrels, and a feature that every luxury watch that's manual wind should include it features a bridal style decoupler in the mainspring barrel so you can't overwind it. Power reserve scale on the dial side. This is as good as it gets. Not necessarily my style, but in terms of fit, finish, and materials, as good as it gets. Imagination, too. All right. Boom. And I see uh, Sutat saying it's bordering on MBNF flair. It's got some rivalry on the table tonight. I'm going to challenge it. I'm going to challenge it with a brand you know, a controversial rival to Richard Mill and Grubel Forsey all at once. And right here, Mike K saying for $600,000, you can buy a flat in Paris and a beachfront flat on a Greek island. That's true. But for a thousand bucks, you can also buy round trip airfare to Miami. And a lot of folks would say we're insane for spending three, four, five thousand dollars on watches in a world where some folks make less than that in a year in some countries. So it's not the degree of our indulgence. Once you've drunk the Kool-Aid, an ounce, a gallon, it really doesn't matter. You're part of the club. Grubel Forcé makes no more sense or less sense than spending $10,000 on a Chichère Le Coult. And I should know, I've done that. Okay, right here I can see this is a watch that Fjord Prefect calls a diorama dial. And right here, Amro is saying the best SIHH Grubel Forcé GMT. That's a fact, and they have released several now. That is the latest iteration of their GMT Earth. I can also see right here, question from Adamos, where's Clive? I have no idea. Clive's usually a regular in our live chat. Let's jump into a challenger. A challenger with a tourbillon from a manufacturer with an oversized, extravagant, open movement architecture that I know is going to polarize. 45 millimeters in diameter from the signature Excalibur collection. It's the Spider Carbon flying tourbillon. 
from Roger Dubuis, part of the 2018 collection. This is a watch that polarizes, not because of anything inherent in it, but, and, and I should mention, this watch is available exclusively through Claudio at our boutique on Walnut Street. This is a watch that now challenges the likes of Richard Mille. Is Richard Mille a manufacturer? No. They make hardly anything. Do they make their modules? No, that's Dubois de Praz. Do they make their base calibers? No, that's generally Vauche. Do they construct their own grand complications? No, Richard Mille depends on Renault et Papy, the special complications arm of AP. Roger Dubuis, on the other hand, makes everything, the balance, the escapement, the hairspring, the case, just about everything but the stones and the sapphire, and they can't catch a break. Why? because of the 90s Roger Dubuis watches that people still remember. Now let me show you how this works. This is a quick release lug system that unfortunately I was playing with beforehand and did not properly fit back. But let me actually show you how that works before I put it on the wrist. This is new for 2018. There is a quick release lug system and what's impressive is that I can activate it with my minimalist nails. And my nails are now pathetic because I have to manicure myself every day for the watch review videos I put on. They complained that you needed a screwdriver to change the strap on a Dubuis. So they fixed it. In 2018, you have a IWC-like quick release system, but I can tell you having stumped my nails on those IWCs and Cartier Roadsters, this system works better. So let's go back to the wrist shot now. You could see that it's 45 millimeters, but it wears easy. Entirely in carbon fiber inside and out, it's a sports watch through and through. Now it's swimmable with 50 meter water resistance, so it matches the Richard Mill RM11 standard. But what stands out is the fact that the entire movement with Geneva Hallmark is made of carbon fiber. It's a 90 hour power reserve manually wound, and you can see the flying tourbillon. Extraordinary beating away at 3 hertz or 21,600 vibrations per hour. It features a honeycomb pattern underneath a fully skeletonized and hand finished lattice work of sunburst bridges and plates. So let me focus a little bit on, let me get the minute hand out of the way because there's not much going on on the dial of this watch other than those two hands they managed to block the tourbillon. So now this is a watch, let's talk about the Geneva Hallmark. You can see it present and correct right next to the keyless works on the dial side. These are true manufactured products. Like I said, Dubuis makes everything excruciatingly dedicated to building the entire watch in house. Everything but the stones and the sapphires. They can't catch a break because people remember the old homage and sympathy watches. And you know what, you need to get over that because Going back to the Iliad, the heroes of yesteryear were always taller, stronger, and braver. But the reality is that that's just nostalgic reminiscing. Back in the 90s, people hated the sympathies and the homages, calling them perversions, too busy, trying too hard. In their day, they were unloved, which is why they went cheap on the pre-owned market for the better part of two decades. Today, people are saying the same thing about the Dubuis Excaliburs, and you know what? 15, 20 years from now, we'll be teary-eyed reminiscing about these through the rose-colored spectacles. Get them while they're now, and enjoy them today. Don't wait 20 years to discover how great Roger Dubuis is in the year 2018. If you've got the budget, I cannot recommend them highly enough. That's a lovely piece, and one of 88, too. Okay, right here, a new theme, Torbion Tuesday. I think that's already an Instagram handle, guys. I, I would gladly claim it, but I think it's already been taken. So let me jump real quick to two ceramic GMTs of very different persuasions. One from Jajer LeCoultre, one from Grand Seiko. So coming out within 12 months of these of each other, these are both oversized sports watches, 46 millimeters in essentially indelible black ceramic. Let's talk about the the 2015 JLC. This is part of the series of 2015 watches that represented the last really great model year for JLC. 100 meters water resistant, one of the last of the master compressors that seemed so strong during the 2000s. This was a sole survivor along with the red gold ceramic. It's a GMT, a 65 hour power reserve, 100 meter water resistant, a vertical clutch column wheel chronograph, and it features a gorgeous ruthenium coated dial with extravagant 
slightly oversized loomed indices. Now, the same year, Grand Seiko launched its first series of ceramic watches. The one you see here was part of the series internally nicknamed Avant Garde. 46 millimeters in black ceramic. This is the Spring Drive GMT Limited Edition. It featured a couple of standout features. Let me show you one of the most remarkable. There is a special solid gold medallion in the case back that signifies a hot rodded spring drive movement. So you can see the continuously turning unidirectional governing wheel of the spring drive. A standard spring drive has precision of plus or minus 15 seconds per month. This one, plus or minus 10 seconds per month. A limited series of 500. You're talking one of the most accurate watches ever to be made powered exclusively by mechanical energy. It is spring potential energy and kinetic energy that drives this watch exclusively. Let me wind it up so you can see the unique continuous smooth sweep seconds hand of a spring drive. There is no battery in a spring drive. There is no capacitor. There is no stepper motor. It is a mechanically driven system with one notable and ingenious exception. It took from 1977 to 2005 to create an automatic winding spring drive. That Governing wheel, as it turns, wakes up a quartz oscillator through induced current. Engineers, do we remember our left hand rules from high school physics? That's how this watch generates the piddling amount of electricity necessary to govern it with the precision of a quartz watch, but a watchmaker assembled automatic movement serviceable for life. You have mechanical soul and quartz precision with a sensational metallic and lacquered blue dial. 500 pieces limited series 2016 with an ingenious pairing of a grade 5 titanium core case and cladding in ceramic on the outside. If you guys saw my Versus companion over the weekend, you know that you cannot shatter this watch and its family members straight through. An ingenious combination, 100 meters water resistant like the JLC. It's hard for me to choose between the two of them. I would choose the JLC narrowly because, well, it is so narrow. The JLC is a very thin watch at 13.3 millimeters thick. This one is more like 15.7, but they are both gorgeous, black ceramic and blue. This is as kind and gentle as black and blue will ever get. By the way, during the early 80s, if you, were the, if you were the man, you would have had tickets to the Black and Blue Tour. It was the Blue Oyster Cult touring with Black Sabbath. I regret being born as late as 1984. Had I been born 10 years earlier, I would have made it to that concert. As a child, I would have made it to that concert. If you guys have photos from the Black and Blue Tour from the early 80s, send them to Monday Mailbag at the Watchbox. Send me your wrist shots from a concert. Those are the wrist shots I want for the next Monday show. All right, jumping in. I can see Abdul is in there, a big fan of Grand Seiko, but saying the, G the JLC looks better. Mike K saying the GS is such a great value. That's a fact, even better pre-owned. Let me see, where can I end tonight on a high note? Have I shown everything on the table? Just about everything. All right, I want to ask you guys, signing off, can you think of a better comparison and contrast to close our feature than a $600,000 Gribble 4C and a $2,300 Oris Diver 65? You know what? I can't. I love them both. This is a great example of how the hobby can be accessible and equally enjoyable at a broad range of budgets. You can buy this watch for about $1,500 pre-owned, even less in some cases. Full bracelet, rivet style, vintage evocative to match the theme of the watch. You can have this and have an absolute ball with it. Or you can have this. You can have them both. Make this your everyday driver. Make this your special occasion watch. Neither one of these is guaranteed to put a bigger smile on your face than the other. Ultimately, it comes down to your tastes and not the watch itself, but your capacity for imagination because it's imagination and the values we ascribe to these watches that ultimately determine how much we appreciate and enjoy this hobby. Guys, Oris and Grubel Forsey, both winners in my book. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm giving away a watch next month and I'm gonna announce it on our next show tomorrow. The Watch Insider on our other channel, Brian Goffberg is back, the theme is Panerai, and I'm telling you what raffle watch you're gonna win for the month of October. Thank you so much. This has been Watches Live. This is Watchbox Reviews. I'm Tim. Thanks to you. Thanks to the crew. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.